Well, it's uh, one minute after five. Time to get started. And it looks like we're having a little bit more luck with the technology today. Uh, and uh, I'll hop around here a little bit after class on Wednesday. And I think it was a bulb that burned out, but I'm not sure. At any rate, it's working today. And I'd like to start by talking about the Renaissance and mannerism in Cinquecento, Italy, which really means the 1500s. And Mackenzie, good to see you. I said, good to see you. Um, Bottom line, bottom line is that this century in this place in Italy is kind of widely considered to be probably the high point of Western art. You'll get people that will dispute that, but it is where we get sort of the culmination of all of these technological and artistic developments, they all kind of seem to come together in the early 1500s in Italy. And so among the great artists of the time, Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo, and Raphael. And basically, it kind of hits where the technological artistic developments have been uh, accumulating for a hundred years. And there's also a political side to this, too. And the political side has everything to do with the fact that there's a growing separation between Northern Europe and Southern Europe. And that is between the Catholic Christians and the Protestant Christians, and they diverge in this century. We also see a lot of other developments in Italy. Um, but let's take a look at the work. And so this is a kind of an interesting map they put on here because they have Rome with the Renaissance and Baroque monuments. They could have easily done the map of Florence as well. But bottom line is that the Vatican reasserts its power in this century. Uh, as I said, there were developments in the North. We see the Reformation. We see the Counter-Reformation coming right out of Vatican City. And so this is Rome. I have a couple of slides that I only told you about on Wednesday, but I have them here. And first of all, this is the tribute money by Masaccio, 1425. And this is one of the early examples of one point perspective. And these, this would be the horizon line right there at Christ's head. And you see all the perspective lines lead right to Christ. And so it was perspective for the purposes of creating the illusion of space, but there was also another theological component to that. And that is that everything converges on Christ. And so anyway, we talked about that, talked to you about give Caesar what is Caesar's and so on. I also mentioned about art history as a discipline. What happened before this time, if you were in AD, AH 100, you'll note that before 1400, 
the names of the artist are often, the identities are often unknown. You see a lot of statues and paintings and, and mosaics and frescoes, and it'll just say from the palace of, from the cathedral of, or whatever. But we don't know who did it. And in part, they had a different attitude towards artists. And artists were revered to be sure, but by and large, they were seen as craftspersons. They were skilled workers, but they weren't quite looked at as, as artists, as we know the term today. And so if you would have an analogy about things that happen in this day and age, for instance, in this building, it took a lot of skilled workers to put this together. There had to be sheet metal workers to put in the duct work, electrical workers to wire all of this up, carpenters, painters, etc. But you don't see their names like signed on anything. My name's Jimmy. I put in the electrical wiring. No, nope, doesn't happen. And that's kind of how artists were looked at prior to 1400. But in 1400, we start knowing who these people are. And it's going to be a rare occasion in this part of the art history that we won't know who did what. And much of that actually changed with this. And this is the Brunt's piece from a book by a guy named Giorgio Vasari. It was done in the early 1500s. And he himself was a painter, by the way. La Vita. Anybody know Italian in here? No? That means the life or the lives of the excellente, the excellent architects, architecti, pittori, which is painters, they make pictures, and sculptures. And so the rest of it, I don't know. But by Giorgio Vasari, and basically, he wrote, about these people like they were rock stars, which they were at the time. And so he gave a biography. He also listed the works that they did and gave kind of a critique of, of what their relative strengths and contributions were to the arts. And here is a page. Leonardo da Vinci, Pittori, as we saw that. It's Pitt with the abbreviation of period. And sculpture, sculptor, excuse me. And Fior, which means that he came from Florence. But at any rate, this is da Vinci. This is much of what we know about him comes right out of Giorgio Vasari. And so talking about da Vinci, let's take a look at what he did. Leonardo da Vinci, Madonna of the Rocks. I want to kind of zoom in on part of this too, if you don't mind. Uh, what he did was that he was more than a painter and a sculptor. He was an inventor and he was a scientist. And so a lot of that stuff we were talking about in the 1400s, technological and scientific discoveries actually improved or enhanced the art making. For instance, 
you couldn't get linear perspective if you did not know geometry. You didn't understand that mathematical concept. Be kind of hard to figure out perspective. But see, we find mathematical one point perspective in, in Da Vinci, but there's also something going on here. And this is, as I said earlier, the Madonna of the Rocks. But see, like in this area, in the back, you see the light coming from the back because this is all a cave-like structure. And the rocks are less distinct. They're a little bit out of focus. And what Da Vinci called that was the perspective of interposing space, we now call that atmospheric perspective. And that is that, for instance, say you're the Smoky Mountains and you take a look out, the mountains that are closer appear to be much more distinct, much more crisp, much clearer. And as you go away, they become less clear and actually oftentimes take on a blue appearance because of the way air works and it's related to why the sky is blue as well. But at any rate, that's what we got here, atmospheric perspective. We see here too, some of the other things that have gone on in the early Renaissance. And that is that the Madonna, the mother of Christ is actually, actually, a beautiful woman, not this kind of stone, generic kind of person. She looks like somebody was very warm, very caring, a very good mother, and very young, and very beautiful. And so uh, what we have here, these are these two figures. This is an interesting thing. This is Christ. How would we know that's Christ? Anybody who took the other class would know that. The iconography of Christ giving the blessing. And you'll see depictions over a thousand, fifteen hundred years of Christ doing this blessing or forgiveness. And so even as a baby, he's still doing that. And the other part of this is it's kind of an interesting thing. He kind of looks like a baby too. He's a little chubby. You know, he doesn't look like a 35-year-old guy shrunk down. And so this is something that's been kind of an issue for many centuries. How do you depict the infant Christ? because at once Christ is all knowing and Christ is a baby. So you got to kind of balance that. And that's what Leonardo did here. The other issues here, this is all really pretty cool, is that no longer are we having problems with depicting cloth over a human body. The folds, the light, the way the light hits the folds, all that's all worked out. And this guy right here, any guesses? If you know, you won't have to guess. And I would take it. John the Baptist. And there are some people biblical scholars, and especially of the time, who believed that John the Baptist and Christ were cousins, that John Baptist was actually born to the sister of Mary. And so the idea that they would, and they were of a similar, they were close together in age. And 
This is the baby John the Baptist. And this is an angel who's there as guardian and pointing to John the Baptist. And Mary with her blessing, too. So anyway, what can you take away from this? Well, religious art is still a big deal. It will remain a big deal for quite a while. But not always. And here, cartoon for Madonna and Child with St. Anne, which is Mary's sister, the mother of the infant St. John, St. John the Baptist, and the Christ child. And so this is a, I said it's a cartoon. Is this a cartoon? It was in the day. And it was in the day because in those days they called drawings cartoons. We take it to mean like Cartoon Network. SpongeBob is cartoon. But back 500 years ago, it was a drawing. And it was a preparatory drawing. And you do a bunch of these to kind of work out how you put your painting together. So it is a cartoon, uh, 1507. And so you can see Leonardo, he's a great painter and he draws quite well too. Uh, here is one of his most famous. He didn't do a lot of paintings, I gotta tell you, but what he did do is highly prized and magnificent. And so this is his last supper. And this is before the restoration. One of the things it says, oil and temper on plaster. And it's in the re refectory, Santa Maria della Grazi in Milan. What this is, in essence, and you see a little bit of this here, there's, that's a doorway. And this was painted over a doorway, and it was in a refectory, which was a monastery. It's where priests and, and monks lived. And this was the door to their dining hall. And so he painted this, this reminder of the Last Supper as all of these monastics took their daily meals. And so that's really what this is. And you can see in this the principles of one point perspective. If you follow these lines here from the ceiling, you'll see they really pretty much converge on Christ. A little bit above here, but bottom line, Christ is in the center. Christ is the center of all things. And what you have here is a lot more drama. We see in the North, they're really pretty good at painting figures, human figures, but they're mostly pretty stiff. The Italian painters, especially of the Renaissance, high Renaissance, they give you a lot of hand gestures and a lot of facial expressions, and they're very, very animated, which is something that uh, is a hallmark of the high Renaissance. And so here are those perspective lines that I was talking about. Converge on the price. And this is what this looks like today because they restored this. One of the issues about this painting, The Last Supper, and it's been an icon for 500 years, but one of the things that Leonardo did was as a scientist and an artist, he always experimented 
with his paint, his media. And so what he has here, it's oil and temper on plaster, but he actually introduced some, some measure of wax and varnish and other substances that we don't really know about. But after this was painted, it started actually, started to self-destruct. It wasn't a very permanent mixture, although we do believe that originally it was very bright like this. And so like a lot of these paintings from the high Renaissance, they've been restored. And typically how they get restored is that they get a bunch of scholars together and they do some chemical analysis. They take a look at what is physically there. They put it under spectral analysis. They do chemical analysis and so on. And on top of that, if they can find the notes that these, or the drawings that these artists had, the cartoons, if you will, they'll use that, they'll gather as much evidence as possible to try to make this, this kind of artwork as good as new, if you don't mind me saying that. And on top of that, since these are like really treasured works of art, typically corporations and wealthy donors actually pay a lot of money to finance these operations. And here I put the star on the Mona Lisa I've been telling about this is probably the most prized painting in Western civilization. And I talked to you guys a little bit about this earlier when I'm telling you about how it was my favorite. And those ideas of atmospheric perspective, you can see that play out behind the Mona Lisa. You can see that the details of the landscape seem to become more obscure in the distance and clearer as they are mirrored. And you could see the atmosphere back there. It, and this is a totally invented landscape. Another thing, they got so good at this that they didn't need a, a landscape to model because they knew how to make this and they could invent it. And so you'll find all of these almost fantastic landscapes. There's, and if I could make an analogy, in a lot of ways, that's not any different than CGI today, that, that you have artists, filmmakers, they're, at a computer, they know what, what you need to do to make a believable landscape and they just do it. And it's not just them, it's Bob Ross too. He'll, he'll make some of that. Anyway, Leonardo and here's one of his drawings. As I was saying, he was a scientist. He was a scientist that was kind of a rogue. He was a rogue in the sense that some of his research took him out of favor of the church. For instance, he did, in this case, you see uh, the fetus and the lining of the uterus. Such a great technical medical drawing, you could still use this today. It's that accurate. But and all right, maybe I'll add this first. He did all kinds of drawings of human anatomy, the bones, the muscles. 
the ligaments, the organs, everything. And how he did that was that he paid some grave robbers to go dig up some fresh graves and he could cut them up and draw them and take notes. And this was his research. And so there's a couple of things about this. One, he's got the drawing of the uterus here and then the cutaway version. That is something that he invented the cutaway illustration. And here are all of his notes. And even if you don't speak Italian, it's going to be kind of hard to read. As I said, he was broke. And if the church ever caught him doing stuff like this, he'd go to, he'd be probably executed or something, at least excommunicated, bottom line. He had to hide his research in case anybody found it. And so here are his notes and all of his observations, but they're written backwards. And so the only way you can read this is hold it up to a mirror. And it was his own code of trying to keep this quiet in case this fell into the wrong hands. Uh, Vitruvian Man, another anatomical study. And here, he's got a circle and he's got a square. And basically, this is a study of mathematical proportions and human anatomy. And so that's what's going on. It's not just Leonardo, it's many of the artists of the age. They're bringing their knowledge from all of the disciplines, including ancient Greek and Roman philosophy and mythology, <laughs> as well as mathematics and medicine, physiology, et cetera, et cetera. And they kind of saw everything as kind of fitting into a nice, neat, unified package. And so for somebody like Leonardo to him doing scientific experiments, cutting up cadavers, and being a painter and a sculptor and inventor didn't seem like, seem like, the right thing to do. It, it was seamless, if you will. And so a lot of this stuff, the Mona Lisa and this Vitruvian man, that's still used a lot. It's used a lot in, in support of Renaissance thinking, ancient Greek and Roman philosophy. It's used in support of the statement of the thesis. Man is the measure of all things. And so here it is. When you hear that, it comes out of the Renaissance. It comes out of classical Greek and Rome. Uh, and reemergence in the 1500s. Another, so he was an architect too, and then he, uh, central plan for a church, uh, got his, got his notes here. And the church here is kind of looks, uh, kind of, you know, boilerplate, but when you take a look at this from the top, you'll see that it is really about geometry and proportions, and the idea that a church should fit all of ge geometric mathematical principles. And so this is another plate 
from Giorgio Vasari's The Lives of the Excellent Painters, Art, uh, Architects, and Sculptors. This is Raphael. And this is what he did. Marriage of the Virgin, uh, Albazzini Chapel. And here you go. And here you have it. This is the Virgin. This is Joseph. This is the rabbi. Because, hey, they were Jewish. They say. And so, again, a lot of dramatic effects, a lot of uh, body language, and linear perspective. And so Raphael, he was kind of an interesting guy as a person. Here's what, here's what the Marriage of the Virgin was based on. It was another painting here. Uh, some 10 some odd years before and that was Perugino Christ delivering the king, keys of the kingdom to St. Peter you could see the similarities but I was saying that Raphael was an interesting person we know about that we know about that because of Giorgio Vasari we know that uh Leonardo was kind of a, a reclusive. He was kind of kept to himself. And he was kind of uh, only marginally connected to the Christian Catholic Church in Rome. And in fact, actually spent a lot of time in Southern France as the court painter for the French Pope. Whole lot of stuff. Bottom line is that. Sorry, I forgot to turn this off. Um, but at any rate, but you see the the difference being here in in a lot of ways is that Perugino makes this a very long composition. Raphael, not so much kind of compact, kind of gets right to the center. It's what they did. Raphael, Madonna in the meadow. Here we go. And we got St. John the Baptist. We got the Christ. We got the Madonna. We have the invented landscape. And see how those mountains in the background are bluish and kind of out of focus? That's what I was talking about, the atmospheric perspective. Uh, and so Raphael was kind of, kind of a, a favorite of a lot of people. He was very popular in his age. Uh, and this is probably his most famous work. It's in Vatican City. It's in the Apostolic palace and it's a big fresco and it's in this room and I want to kind of point out something one point perspective to be sure except for one place and that's this box in order to have one point perspective everything has to be parallel to the front of the picture and this is not, it's actually turned. So the vanishing point on this box would end up being here, same horizon line, but a different vanishing point from all of the lines of all of the architecture and the floor and everything else. This is tilted. And again, they like to play with perspective and it became kind of symbolic. This figure right here, by the way, is a portrait of 
Michelangelo. And he was a guy during his time, he was kind of a, a renegade, kind of a rogue, kind of a nonconformist, if you will. So we got Leonardo, the scientist, Raphael, who is like this rock star guy, and Michelangelo, who's is kind of moody, irritable. And you can see there, he's by himself. Is kind of thinking, not paying attention. But the overall allegory here is this. You know what I mean by allegory, by the way? Good. An allegory is when you kind of make a comparison. Uh, that you give one story that has a parallel to something else and a whole other meaning. And so Plato, I write about this, the allegory of the cave. Katie, you've heard it. What happened? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, what, what the allegory is, is that these people were put in a cave and they didn't have contact with other people. And outside the cave, the light would shine in and cast the shadows of the people from the outside. To the people inside the cave, the shadows were the people. That's an allegory. It's like things are not what they seem. If your experience is limited, it's gonna affect your perceptions. And this is kind of an allegory in that way too. And we have all of these figures who are at once great figures from ancient Greece, and they also are people cont of contemporary Italy of the time. And I got to, here's the, here's the uh, perspective lines. And as I said, you can see the one here, but here is the list, and 13, Heraclitus, Michelangelo, 14, 14, uh, Plato, Leonardo da Vinci, 15, Aristotle, and another artist. And so anyway, here's what we know, we can identify these people, and he's doing an allegory, which is kind of self-serving because they thought of themselves at the time as being the equal of the great thinkers and artists, philosophers of ancient Greece. And so that's where you get all of these. Uh, this allegory, that's spelled out. I want to kind of point to something here, too. What? It's not me. Oh, okay. It's set. This guy right here, see where my hand is there? This young guy kind of peeking around the corner. That is Raphael himself. He put himself in this painting as a young man, and you can see he's much younger than da Vinci and Michelangelo. And there he is, just kind of looking back at the audience, kind of clipper. And so philosophy, the School of Athens, again. And this is in the Vatican. So 
that should tell you something too that by this time the vatican is really embracing all of the knowledge and the culture of ancient greece and rome before this time all of that was considered to be pagan pre-christian and don't even go there and and now they're actually they've changed which is another aspect of another reason why the north moves into the reformation because they still saw this as pagan but there's your perspective lines there's and you can see he is extremely skilled this is right before he died he died in 1520 three years before his death uh but check this out this is this is all of the stuff that we looked at in david hockney's masters secrets of the old masters he got the shine he got the engraving he's got the book the book is the page is kind of bolded in a strange sort of way and the illustrations follow that the way the cloth is it's satin of some sort and so it reflects light a little differently this is velvet and it reflects the light even more differently uh, and another thing that he's doing here this is going to be a big thing the next big thing he's not really using perspective to create the illusion of deep space he's using using darkness and this will become known as chiaroscuro dark modeling and a number of painters following the death of Raphael will take up this method of dark modeling. And you can see the modeling is so dark that some of these figures actually blend right into the background. There's no difference between the back of his head and the background. And so he's using he's using the viewer and our perception to kind of fill that out. This would be an implied line, if you will. It's not actually a line. It's not there. It just fades into the darkness. Dark modeling. Uh, another portrait. Baldessari Castiglione. Uh, so they're skilled. He's skilled. He's a great painter. A fresco, Galatia. And this is out of Greek mythology, too. And Kaylee, you were the one that liked. Uh, uh, Venus, uh, I, keep, I keep thinking of the, <clears throat> the birth of Venus. The birth of Venus. I'm sitting there going, Venus on the half shell, which is what a lot of people call it. Yeah, the birth of Venus by uh, uh, Botticelli. But see, this is really the same sort of thing. much more active the figures are fuller they're rounder the space is not quite as flat uh much more activity in terms of the gestures the body language and so on but it's the same theme and again see hey we got over here check this out centaur half horse half human so yeah they're really going all in 
on the Roman mythology, and they don't see a contradiction that this is unchristian. As a matter of fact, they even put angels up here, which is a very Christian sort of thing. And so anyway, uh, Raphael. And finally, of the big three artists of the era, Michelangelo. And it says that he here is, uh, he does painting, sculpture, and he is an architect, and that is quite correct. And you could see he's a little older than what we saw Raphael. There's the young Raphael. There's Michelangelo. And he was a great sculptor. And this is a Pieta, which is the common name for this scene. The Virgin Mary holding the body of the dead Christ. You call that the Pieta. Uh, just like you see the Madonna in throne, where you see Virgin Mary and baby Jesus on a throne. It's just the, it's just the name of this scene. But check this out. It was absolutely phenomenally skilled. This is marble. And check it out how the light hits those arms. You can see all of the muscles and some of the veins. Uh, you can see the ribs, you can see the muscle, you can see that he's, his body is limp because he's dead. You can see the expression on her face of sadness. And so uh, this, it's in St. Peter's in Vatican City. And this is considered one of the great sculptures of all time. As a matter of fact, 1964, this is kind of a, a side bar. These works of art have come to represent Western culture in, in really a very profound way. And this, sitting in the Vatican, in 1964, there was somebody deranged, terrorist type, came at this sculpture and started hitting it with a hammer because he wanted to make a statement about his revulsion with Western culture. And so, yeah, he broke off, hit it right there. They have since repaired this, but bottom line, can you imagine that? That you would get so angry as to destroy a work of art? I know it seems it seems very foreign to us, but these things have and still do represent Western culture in a very profound sort of way. Um, and so, what we have here is that Michelangelo was a sculptor from Florence, and Florence had a long tradition of great artists. And Pope Julius II, oh, I have his paintings in different places. Pope Julius II brought Michelangelo to the Vatican and said, you got to paint my ceiling on the Sistine Chapel. By the way, this has been restored too. It was restored in the 1990s with generous funding from Mitsubishi Motors from Japan actually finances. But the creation of Adam, it's one of the it's one of the panels here, if I could find it, of the Sistine Chapel ceiling. You can see it right there. And basically what's on this ceiling here, if you will, 
is the book of Genesis. It's painted all over the ceiling. And this is the creation of Adam, detail of the Sistine Chapel. And so, how should I say this? Michelangelo didn't want to do it. He said, you got a bunch of great painters here. Let Raphael do this. Let somebody else do it. I'm not a painter. Pope Julius told him, I am the Pope, and you're going to do this, period. And so it took him a long time, like, uh, like four years or so to complete this. And it was really quite, quite an undertaking because you could see here, look at how high up this is. So they had to build scaffolding. And it's fresco. And if you know about fresco, you'll know that it is a kind of paint, it's plaster is what it is. And you mix pigments with the plaster, you apply it just like if you're plastering a wall and then you let it dry. All of the pigment comes back to the surface. It's just part of the drying process. So you really have to know what you're doing. You have to know how much pigment to put into the plaster. And the second very difficult part of this is that it dries in one day. You can't, you got to figure out how much you're going to paint in one day. Because overnight it dries. You can't go back into it. It's permanent. And so the, you'll see if you got like a really good look at this, you'll see that a lot of these lines kind of depict, they can pick out how much Michelangelo did in one day. And so anyway, you can still see some of the cracks in the ceiling, but what happened is this, so it was painted 1508, 1512. It took them four years, as I said. And what happened through this, through this time, was that the roof leaked and kind of tore up some of the ceiling here. Candle smoke. Smoke rises, 500 years of burning candles in here kind of gave this all a dingy, dull coat of wax. And it was in terrible shape. And so anyway, in the 1980s and through the 1990s, they restored all of this. Uh, and so I'm gonna kind of, Go right here. But he was, after all, a sculptor. And he ended up doing the sculpture for the tomb of Julius II because as right after, right after Michelangelo did the Sistine Chapel ceiling, uh, not long after, Pope Julius died. And this is his tomb, but he commissioned Michelangelo to make his, to do the sculptures on his tomb. Uh, this is Moses. And what's it? This is a mistranslation from the ancient Greek. As I said, these guys did a lot of research and they really read a lot of the manuscripts from ancient Greece and Rome, and especially the early uh, transcriptions of the Bible. And somewhere along the way, they had written about Moses, the Moses with the Ten Commandments, 
as you see here, uh, with a halo, but they weren't, there's a mistranslation. And they thought it said that Moses had horns. So that's how they did the sculpture, Moses with horns, not with halo, you say. Could happen to anybody. Um, bound slave, rebellious prisoner, again, sculpture, and his most famous. And this was done before he came to Florence to work for the Pope. This was his probably his masterwork, at least we seem to think that is. David, now you guys remember what I told you about David and the Donatello, David and, uh, uh, and the other Davids depicted as the smart, young warrior. And this is Michelangelo's version. And here is something to kind of note. Of all of the depictions of David that we've seen, this appears to be much more like an ancient Greek statue. It is taking all of the, what you would call conventions of classical Greek sculpture and put them, employed them. And so there's a couple of things, I talk about this from time to time. You see that tree branch there? What's that for? His family tree. Are you feeling no, it's not. I was just, I was just. That's exactly what that is. And you'll find that's what happens in a lot of the sculpture. Marble is pretty strong and it's really heavy. And this sculpture would be extremely top heavy and the places most likely to break would be there at the ankles. So he has David and the weight is supported by this leg. And as you said, David, perfectly, this is there to strengthen that leg so that this statue won't. But there's been much written about Michelangelo's David and they talk about its fidelity, its uh, adherence to the ideals of ancient Greece and they talk about how he looks strong and confident and he's the tension in his arms look like he could just about take a punch but he's very thoughtful the idea that it's wisdom and knowledge And here's some more, a Pieta, what did I say about, this is the Virgin Mary, this is the dead Christ, a Pieta. That's the subject, uh, show you this one. Um, another, this is in the Medici Chapel. The Medici's, by the way, were a very rich family from Florence. And a lot of the reasons why there was so much artistic activity in Florence, as well as scholarship and intellectual uh, works, is because the Medici's spent their money on this stuff. They made a lot of money, but they, they made they educated a lot of artists and 
painters and, and writers and researchers and science, scientific uh, research and so on. And so anyway, this is the interior and that's what we talked about. I'm talking about this. There's a lot of people talk about this part of the creation of Adam. There's Adam, there's God, there's his angels. And this is a cross section of a human brain. And there are a lot of people that have noticed that the shape of whatever it is that God is writing on is maybe not. Maybe this is a depiction of the human brain. And maybe it's not the creation of Adam as much as it is the enlightenment of Adam. Intelligence. You see, they're really talking a lot very philosophically about things from the Bible. And they talk about this little space here as like being the spark of knowledge, the spark of intelligence. Not like he's creating Adam, he's endowing Adam with intelligence. And more from the Sistine Chapel ceiling, uh, the fall of man, Adam and Eve, Eating from the fruit, getting driven out of Eden. Uh, Libyan Sybil. Uh, and here it is at the beginning of the cleaning and restoration process. That's what I was telling you about uh, how they restored this. It's at the beginning, and this is what it looked like when they were done. The smoke, the moisture deterioration of 500 years blown up. And behind that altar, and this was painted some 25 years after the fact, Michelangelo painted the area behind the altar. You can see the crucifix and the candles. The altar is here in the front. And this is the area behind the altar. And this is the last judgment. Uh, and it's kind of a shift from all of the glorification of ancient Greece and Rome. And as a matter of fact, this is really another allegory about paying for your sins and being cast into hell if you're not a good person. I want to show you something else here if I can find one. And oh. I show you this part. This is uh, empty skin. This was so, said to be like uh, a self portrait of Michelangelo himself. And, and I don't see any of what I was going to show you. And that is that at one point, another artist came through and put loincloths on all of the new figures. And this looks like post-restoration. And that was one of the things they did. They kind of put it back to the original. But these things, these artworks have their own history. Uh, and so what we have here is a century of art and we start to, after the death of Raphael in 1520, well, we kind of reach the apex. And artists start really kind of building on all of the discoveries and all of the innovations made during the High Renaissance. And this is a guy, uh, Andrea del Sarto, Madonna of the Herpes, of Harpies, excuse me. Uh, and the Harpies are these, these little figures here. They're like kind of like elves and they're kind of like angels. And so anyway, you can see some of the things that they explored. One is chiaroscuro. That becomes that becomes a way of painting. 
Uh, and so I got the architecture and this is uh, Romante again. The architecture takes on the characteristics of ancient Rome. And you see, this is uh, Vermonte's design for St. Peter's. That's what this said. And it says St. Peter's uh, at the Vatican. And Michelangelo, and this is his last name. You're an art. You're an art. T, excuse me. And so anyway, he was an architect and he was a sculptor more than he was a painter, but he was what they would call a Renaissance man. A guy who could do everything pretty well. And just like Michelangelo, they did they thought all of this was pretty seamless. If you knew art and you did mathematics, you knew engineering. You could be an architect and a sculptor and a painter as well. Uh, the Dome, St. Peter's by Michelangelo. And again, I showed you this in the other chapter. They really do away with a lot of the ornamentation. And it's really about proportions and simplicity and mathematical precision. And kind of go right through this real quickly. Other painters, Bellini, you can see some of the similarities to the high Renaissance. Uh, Feast of the Gods, Bellini. And so, you know, again, this is the Feast of the Gods, plural. And so it is a hearkening back to ancient Greece and Rome. Uh, the Tempest, Titian. Titian's like huge. Uh, the Assumption of the Virgin. And so, yeah, they, they can do all kinds of things. They can create space, they can create clouds that are held up by the angels, lifting Mary up to heaven. Uh, Titian, another Titian. Another meeting, Bacchus, Andrea Nate. Venus of Urbino. This is like huge. This is another one of Chiaroscuro to be sure. The dark modeling and see so parts of this, you can't see the difference between her hair and her head and the dark background. Dark modeling here. Uh, Venus, beauty, love, Roman. And finally, Lavinia Fontana. And what we start to see here, enlightenment, we start to see the emergence of women artists. For all of this time, as far as we know, that uh, women were kind of excluded from art making. It was a man's world. The men were artists. And National Museum of Women in the Arts, 1580. And so, this is real short. You booked a sunny Argos ski chalet with endless views of snow covered peaks, a stove that inspires magnificent hot. Media Montana Conservation Project. Bank of America Global Art Conference. 
conservation project began in 2010. We're now in our ninth year. Since we began, we've provided grants for conservation for hundreds of different projects in 31 countries. The grant is designed to shine a light on the need for conservation, to shine a light on different uh, cultural traditions around the world. Every year, we try to have a balance of projects that includes many museums in many different countries. We spend plenty of time with our National Gallery of Art. Son's time of the Olympic history. Of course, it's history associated with it. It's also very exciting because she is a relatively young female art designer at the Smithsonian. And we don't think of there being such a thing as a female Renaissance artist. And so this is very important. And I saw this right. Uh, it's a good place to stop. The high renaissance. No drugs. No mountains. Just lofty in another sense. And so one last reminder as I came in today. I only had eight submissions for quiz one. So if you haven't done that, please, I should have 12. And eight is like four minutes. So I'm still waiting on four of you. I'm not going to name names. But I sure like you guys being here. And I hope we can be here on Wednesday. There's supposed to be a great snowstorm. We'll see. And oftentimes, when there's a snowstorm, they'll cancel classes after five o'clock sometimes, too. It's happening. So, anyway, keep an eye on the weather, keep an eye on canvas. When I know something, I'll let you know. Classes are canceled. I will put it on an announcement. And hopefully I'll see you Wednesday. Yes, yeah, thank you. Bye. Thanks. Yes. Thank you. you too.